All right, so I think we're gonna get started and let people trickle in as they come. So uh, I just wanna say welcome everyone to the Wilson Center. My name is Alex Long and I'm part of the Science and Technology Innovation Program. In case this is the first time that you guys have ever been to the center, I just wanted to give a little bit of a background on what the Wilson Center is. So we're a quasi-federal think tank where we try to use research to inform policy. Woodrow Wilson was the first president with a PhD. So our mission is we are a lot of academics who come together and try to tackle mostly foreign policy, but also cross-cutting issues worldwide uh, through innovative research that is cutting edge and just constantly updating. And we try to be on the ball for it for the federal government. Uh, I also want to say that the Science and Technology Innovation Program is really strong in boosting paradigms and trying to understand the space. So we do work in AI, we do work in citizen science and environmental policy. And this brings me to why we're all here today, One Health. One Health, as we all know, uh, is one of the most exciting public health paradigms, I think, currently working. Uh, it combines three completely important sectors and tries to bring them together, which is what the Wilson Center can do in a moment like this. We're convening all different aspects. When I was going through all of the attendees of this conference, the, the depth and breadth of professionals that are in this room right now and also watching at home uh, is incredible and also speaks to why One Health is so important because not only does it work to make the world healthier, it also works to create networks between agencies that may not have before. You can see uh, Department of Education people talking to people at the DOD, talking to people DHS, talking to people in the NIH, because One Health is as much education as it is systems building as it is healthcare. And it's exciting. It's something that the Wilson Center is really, really uh, excited to take on here with this kickoff event, because this is our first time really taking hold of One Health and doing something about it. And I'm really pleased for you all to be here and really pleased that we were able to partner with EcoHealth Alliance and also the World Bank to hold this event um, to both bring in the federal side and the environmental side to pull together all the great federal work that's being done right now and then also bolster the environmental um, pillar of One Health, which we, if you are in One Health, you know is constantly left out and needs to be investigated further and talked about more on how we assess um, environmental capacity of public health systems. So I just want to basically give a brief rundown of the agenda for the day. First, it's like the next um, important thing is going to be keynotes followed by a panel, followed by a break, followed by a keynote and panel. But then come the breakouts, which are why you all received numbers. So the numbers correspond to the breakout room that you will be going to. Each one will be themed differently. And they were completely randomly assigned, as you all know, because you walked in and just got a random one. Um, there was no thought put into who, who is getting what, because we want the amount of professionals in the room to just intermingle and there to be no crossover. So when you walk in with your friend, you're not just going right into that panel, with, that breakout with them. You get to meet new people and see what other um, professionals are doing in the field. And then that will be followed by a report back panel where one person from each breakout will come sit on this panel. I will be the moderator and we will walk through what was talked about in each of the breakouts. And that will be followed by a networking happy hour that will last about an hour and we'll have um, light hors d'oeuvres and then uh, drinks. So I would also like to invite Dr. Karashev to say anything else or do you want to say something? Well, I don't know if I really can add more to that, Alex. Thank you. Um, certainly thanks to the Wilson Center for hosting us. So I think everybody here is familiar with One Health and probably um, has noticed over the years that it has been as One Health has been pretty much kind of really been taken up on the animal health, zoonotic disease, human health side of things. Uh, but we're looking forward to the Wilson Center helping us engage a new audience. And you haven't had the benefit of seeing the RSVP list, but I have. Um, and it's a very different group here today, so that's very exciting. And I wanted to thank uh, the World Bank. We're represented by Dr. Frank Barta, who will give one of a, the opening talk here. Um, and having the bank engaged, and I think they are recognizing this value of a more systematic and a sy more systems approach to looking at health. Uh, and that's going to be kind of the focus of what we're doing today. 
Hopefully some of our panel speakers will get you stimulated um, for the breakout groups. And what we're really hoping is you come back from those breakout groups with some new ways of thinking and some new ideas, um, maybe some ways to overcome some of the traditional challenges, uh, but to move us forward here in the 21st century. So that's all I have. And thanks again for joining us. All right, so without further ado, Frank, would you like to come up? Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to start by thanking the, uh, the Wilson Center, the, uh, the tremendous work uh, that uh, Alex and Han have, have put together, and, and also Catherine and, and, and Billy at the Eco Health Alliance in putting this uh, uh, program together. Uh, they asked me to be the first one to speak, but really what I'm looking for is to go back to my seat and enjoy listening to my <laughs> colleagues because we have, uh, we have excellent speakers uh, lined up uh, uh, this afternoon. That, 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 that should be uh, uh, very, very interesting. Um, so the title is, uh, is uh, One Health in the 21st Century, and uh, when I was uh, starting thinking about what I would say and talk about, I, I immediately had um, a mental uh, picture of a movie that maybe some of you have seen, and it's a 2013 movie, uh, um, it's uh, Gravity. Um, it's not a masterpiece, it's not a great movie, but um, it has some, uh, some interesting features for us uh, uh, today, I guess. So uh, uh, for those of you who haven't seen the, the, the movie, it's uh, uh, two main characters, uh, one scientist joining a, a, a space shuttle mission, and it's, uh, it's a bit of a routine uh, uh, type of, uh, of, of thing. It's a spacewalk, and, uh, and suddenly, bam, um, the, uh, um, they, they, they are hit by... Um, by uh, space debris and and the shuttle is uh, is busted and uh, and then the 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 old movie is about uh, going back to to earth um, what strikes me when uh, um, i think about this movie is that uh, we're probably at uh, uh, and and now I, I realize that we have nasa colleagues in the in in the in the room but we have we were probably at the top of our of our technology uh, going to uh, to space, and what we see in the background is Earth, is planet Earth, and and um, and to to the point that in the movie it could uh, it could become uh, uh, one of uh, one of the characters, but the, the presence of, of our of our uh, planet is 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 um, is um, striking. The 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 other thing is that uh, despite this uh, high tech and uh, and. Um, uh, this uh, mastering of, of of our lives and and, and humanity, it it seems like when things go wrong, uh, we 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 just go down to down to earth, and this is where this gravity brings us uh, 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 brings us back. And the the, um, the 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 last thing that I found uh, uh, interesting um, um, in relation to our uh, discussions today and. Um, and uh, and this movie is probably the uh, the very last minutes of uh, of, of the movie, uh, when uh, when the the main character uh, comes back down to uh, to earth and 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 swims in this uh, in this uh, lake and and embraces the, uh, the 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 ground and and she's she's in the water, and this embrace is 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 really uh, is really a, a nice picture of uh, of one health. Of us humans being part of uh, of this uh, of this uh, creation of um, of the um, of of our environment, and so um, we have many different definitions of one health, and and I guess that if you ask in the room uh, those very familiar with the uh, with one health and uh, those not being so familiar, but uh, but uh, probably each of us has a has a different uh, um, definition. Basically, and I will give you mine. <laughs> it's about uh, 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 people's health, uh, animal health, and and their interconnection and the the, the connection with the uh, with the with the environment. And so, very often we 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 have different names. Uh, here today, we we talk about one health, but some colleagues uh, would prefer to talk about uh, planetary health, 
uh, EcoHealth, I think that's all together. Uh, they uh, uh, bring us back to the same thing, which is the connection and the interconnection that we want to uh, to put in uh, in in front. Um, and so we have different definitions, we have different understanding, we have different representations that very often are uh, pictures of the views of the world that we may have. Uh, one of uh, uh, the representation that is frequently used is uh, used is uh, is this Venn diagram where we have uh, uh, the three circles representing people, animals, and the uh, environment. But uh, but the reality of uh, our use of uh, of the concept of uh, of one health um, shows circles with very uh, different sizes and 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 uh, inter interrelations. And I think that this is a, a very important message that I would like to pass uh, today, that is the, the, the need to have a, a fairly flexible understanding of, uh, of One Health so that it's, it doesn't become a, a straight jacket, but more uh, uh, an approach, an attitude that, uh, that helps us to, uh, to tackle uh, issues and problems. So, um, one Health in the 21st century, um, I think I will focus on, on what I think are two challenges ahead for, uh, uh, for the One Health community. Um, and then I will try to, to finish uh, with a silver lining and, 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 and an opportunity. I think that so far uh, we've focused our, our attention too much on, on uh, infectious diseases and uh, uh, Bill touched on, uh, on, on, on that already, uh, and the relation between humans and, and, and animals. And there is a bit of a trauma, I think, uh, for us because of SARS, uh, because of H5N1, because of H1N1, uh, because of Ebola, and, um, and, and we, we were still living in this fear of the next pandemics, uh, what's coming up, uh, uh, and um, and and so we we've been very much trapped into into this uh, narrative of uh, of infectious diseases and and the big bang, and maybe we should step one step back. And of course, um, we th there's good there are good reasons apart from the the the, the few crises that um, I was uh, uh, mentioning. There are good reasons for us to uh, uh, to concentrate on infectious diseases. Uh, we usually consider that we share two thirds of of uh, uh, um, our uh, pathogens, which means that um, about seventy percent of infectious diseases having uh, uh, in in humans have their origin in in animals. So uh, yes, uh, we share. Uh, rabies with uh, uh, bats, with dogs and, and, and foxes. Uh, we share tuberculosis with uh, uh, cows and badgers. Uh, we share uh, uh, Nipah with uh, bats and, uh, and pigs. We share influenza with pigs and, and birds. We share West Nile with uh, 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 birds and, uh, and horses. So there, there is uh, uh, this, uh, this sharing and, 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 the, and the burden in, in, in some cases has become so important that uh, we I, it has it has uh, uh, taken up uh, probably uh, most of our attention um, when we we talk about one health and back to my Venn diagram and my three circles um, there is one circle that has been uh, often uh, uh, forgotten that is the one of of environment so yes it's there when we represent one health uh, but uh, most of the time we forget that. Of course, if we talk about Rift Valley fever, uh, we will think about uh, uh, vectors, we will think about uh, mosquitoes, uh, we will think about rain, and so we will try to integrate some environmental uh, dimensions uh, to, uh, to the problem. But it's uh, very often a sort of uh, second thought. It's uh, very often uh, putting the, uh, the environment as a, a tributary uh, component of, uh, of, of One Health and not uh, putting uh, um, um, this, uh, this uh, component to the, to, to the forefront. I don't have a PowerPoint today, but um, some of the pictures that we all have in mind are those people in a barren environment with the soil completely cracked by uh, climate change and no rain. 
And I think that you don't need a, an infectious disease there to, 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 to realize how the environment can impact the, uh, the health of, uh, of people and how our lives are affected by, uh, by, by, by that. So I think that one of the challenges that we have now is to, is to bring the uh, environmental component of, of uh, One Health for what it is uh, and, and, and with its uh, importance, which means um, refocusing a bit our attention, less about uh, infectious diseases maybe, uh, although this is, this is uh, important, but, uh, but really integrate those multiple dimensions of, uh, of, of One Health. Um, the the other uh, challenge we, we, we should probably uh, think about and, and that we will discuss today is the one of operationalizing One Health. Uh, One Health is a beautiful intellectual construct. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, if, like me, you, you, you enjoy uh, uh, reading, writing, thinking, and, and, and try to unfold all the dimensions of, uh, of, of, um, of the issues we, we work on around health of animals or, or health of, uh, of, of people. Um, it's all very fine, and, and definitely I enjoy that, but I think that we need to move to the next step, uh, to, to move to the step where One Health becomes really uh, a, a, an, an operational approach to, uh, um, to uh, and especially to, to tackle complex uh, uh, issues and, and, and problems we're, we're facing in many uh, places of, uh, of, of the world. Um, if I take the example of rabies, um, I find it uh, uh, difficult to accept that in the 21st century we still have a problem with rabies. For how many years have we had this uh, uh, beautiful vaccine? It works very well. We know everything we need to know about rabies, but still it's a, it's a, it's a real problem. Um, what really uh, 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 made me uh, 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 seriously mad was uh, the last uh, outbreak of, um, um, of um, in, in Madagascar, I will, plague, plague, right. plague in Madagascar, um, <coughs> where again the, uh, the answer has been to deploy antimicrobials to treat people. But, the, but we know that uh, plague is coming uh, uh, in waves in, in Madagascar, it's there. Uh, in an uh, endemic form. And what we know is that there will be a, a, another wave because the very roots of uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the problem um, have not been addressed. They are still not addressed uh, uh, properly. And so um, there, I think One Health has a, has a, has a real challenge um, to move from theory to, uh, to practice and being able on the ground to uh, um, to uh, not only explore uh, the multiple dimensions of a, of a health problem, but also to, uh, to work on those dimensions, uh, to work up front of a crisis, and to work in a, in a way where we can, uh, we can move to the, to, to, the, to the next step. And if I continue with this, uh, this example of, uh, of plague in Madagascar, um, yes, probably it takes uh, uh, some work on uh, access to uh, health care, but it takes us so uh, uh, to work on uh, on housing. It takes uh, to uh, to work on uh, water sanitation, on uh, uh, food safety and how markets are are handled, control of rodents, uh, uh, control also of the peri-urban agriculture, and uh, of course uh, having an eye also on uh, on climate change. So all these things, we, we know that uh, we could do something about them and we could do uh, a, major, uh, a major difference. And that is really where we have a challenge. It's, uh, it's, to, uh, it's to move One Health from a, a nice intellectual conversation to, um, to something really in, um, in, in operation. Um, in terms of opportunity, I'd like to say that uh, we we are in a world that had uh, uh, that has not been uh, uh, in any situation close with data. We have a lot of data, and we have access to a lot of data. And so things that have been probably difficult so far, uh, because assembling those data, making sense of those data, was uh, was uh, difficult. This is becoming uh, this is becoming possible. And I think that uh, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity of, uh, of the One Health uh, um, community 
to uh, to be able to uh, to work with those uh, those data and to work across uh, of course uh, the uh, uh, the silos and the and and the, um, and, and the disciplines uh, but uh, if you if you just think about it um, whatever you want to know there's a way to uh, to know it and uh, and we see uh, uh, absolutely fantastic uh, innovations in the way people use uh, the data that uh, that are available out there but are usually uh, not not used because we, 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 we don't think about uh, about those data um, as being uh, there and potentially uh, useful. Uh, a great example was to use uh, mobile phone information, for example, in the Ebola crisis to uh, to look at the connectivity of people and predict how they would uh, they would eventually uh, uh, come into into contact for uh, uh, real life. But we have many many examples of uh, of using uh, uh, data in the context of uh, of of, um, of one health um, i think i will stop there uh, but uh, um, again uh, with this uh, with this uh, fascination that i have for the for the principle of one health this uh, this uh, uh, message that i bring especially uh, bring from the world bank that we need now to turn this into into real action on 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 the ground with this uh, i thank you very much for your attention All right, so um, if everyone on panel one wants to come up and we will get started. Thank you so much, Dr. Barrett, for that wonderful opening and really putting One Health into context and showing us both the challenges and opportunities. And I think that feeds perfectly into our first panel, which is themed uh, putting One Health into practice. And you'll see um, our brilliant panel was selected uh, to, to really show the exciting and innovative and diverse applications of One Health in practice. And these are really being operationalized for a variety of different objectives, which I think really shows the value of One Health, you know, not just to one discipline or one goal or one setting, but really across uh, different um, needs and sectors. So I'll introduce them briefly. Their full bios are extremely uh, impressive, and you can find them um, in the, the handout right outside. Um, but we'll start um, with each panelist, and then we'll follow by uh, some discussion and questions. I will ask a few questions, but I'll also invite our panelists to ask questions of one another and raise themes, and then we'll open it up for audience participation and input. Um, I'll start with Dr. Uh, Larry Madoff, who is the, um, the director of the Emerging Disease Surveillance um, System and editor of ProMed Mail, which if you haven't checked it out, you know, please do. I know he'll give a compelling pitch for it, but I think it's such a beautiful example of one health in practice and really brings together human, animal, and um, plant health. Um, so th over to you, Dr. Madoff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, <coughs> And it's uh, th and uh, thank you to the org to Catherine and Billy and the organizers for for having me here today and giving me this uh, opportunity to to talk to you. Um, of course, I'm I'm following uh, Frank's uh, admonition that we pay too much attention to infectious diseases in One Health by telling you uh, that that that's really the only thing that matters. But um, <laughs> so um, <coughs> as Catherine said, I'm an infectious disease doctor and. Uh, even though I went to um, a medical school that has uh, an accompanying veterinary school, um, I, I learned very little about um, uh, the, the concept of One Health or, or really uh, where things fit in the larger perspective. And uh, so, so it's really a, a, a opportunity today to maybe uh, remediate that and uh, hope that the, the next generation learns more um, through, through, through medical school and through all kinds of education about, um, about the world that we live in, which is really uh, what One Health is about. Um, I'll, I'll step back for a minute. Uh, ProMed is the, uh, which, 
which I'm, I'm here representing today, is the Program for Monitoring Emerging Diseases. Um, it's, a, it's a program of the International Society for Infectious Diseases, uh, which is itself a, a nonprofit NGO um, based here in the U.S. Uh, that, that, that espouses um, education around issues of infectious diseases, particularly in um, developing countries. And our goal is to sort of be, be a professional organization for um, infectious disease practitioners of all sorts um, who, who work in infectious disease. Um, it's also an advocacy organization. It sponsors a journal. It sponsors grants programs for, for investigators. Um, but its largest program is ProMed, the Program for Monitoring Emerging Diseases, um, which I've um, had the pleasure of leading for about 15 years now. The program itself is actually um, 25 five years old, it'll be 25 years old in, in August, and it was um, the brainchild of people who were, were smarter than me, um, Jack Woodall, um, Steve Morse, who some of you may know is still um, active in, uh, at Columbia University at Mailman, and Barbara Hatch Rosenberg, a microbiologist from, from New York, um, started and they, they recognized, um, I think, that um, in contrast to the prevailing um, ideology of the day, which, which I think sort of thought that infectious diseases were, were a, a finished battle, that you know, we had sort of done that, been there, we didn't really need to pay much attention to infectious disease threats anymore, that the emergence of new diseases was becoming apparent by then. And they also recognized that the internet was becoming a thing that was moving outside of kind of the, the laboratory and uh, you know, the defense department and was becoming a thing that the rest of us were, were able to access. And they recognized that, that you could kind of merge these things by that, that you could um, spread word about infectious diseases um, at the same, um, you know, maybe with the same speed that infectious diseases themselves would spread. Um, the, the purpose of ProMed has always been um, to be an early warning system for emerging infectious diseases. And uh, it really came out, actually, of the um, biological weapons control movement. Um, and, you know, of course, most uh, of, the, of the pathogens that are thought to be important as potential bio threats from, from uh, weapons are also zoonotic diseases, not just the, uh, the, the diseases that are likely to cause outbreaks, but, um, but those diseases as well. It soon became apparent that you couldn't monitor um, misuse or inadvertent use of, of biological agents without just monitoring all kinds of outbreaks, and that soon became ProMed's focus. Um, it's now grown to about 90,000 um, readers, subscribers, who, who use ProMed. And the goal, again, is to try to be an early warning system. The idea is that if you can detect a threat early and um, institute responses in a timely way, you can um, mitigate uh, uh, the damage done. Um, Larry Brilliant says that um, outbreaks happen, but pandemics are preventable. And I think that that's kind of the, the, the ethos behind, uh, behind ProMed is that you can limit the size and the scope by, by instituting things in a, in a more timely way. The Ebola outbreak in West Africa, I think, is a, is a, was a, an example of where that failed, that, uh, you know, that we didn't see it coming and didn't detect it until too late and didn't respond until too late, and so it, it quickly grew out of control. But other outbreaks are also, um, it can also be contained, and I'd like to think that if we detected them and recognized them early, um, we, we, we could do something about that. Um, in the, um, the context of One Health here um, is, I, I think that, that, that the most of us view One Health as kind of a philosophy or a, 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 an outlook, a way of a, a worldview um, rather than an activity. It's not a discipline or may, maybe it's becoming a discipline, but it's, it's, it isn't per se a thing that we do. It's a lens through which we can work in other areas. And the area that, 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 that I work in is, is, is emerging infectious diseases, where, as we've already said, most of those diseases, at least two-thirds, are, are zoonotic. And where um, the, the host range of a pathogen is 
proportional to the risk of its emergence. So the broader the host range of a pathogen, the more likely that pathogen is to become um, an, emerging, an emerging threat. And so that is why ProMed has always espoused this, um, uh, this philosophy, this worldview that One Health is really critical to doing the, the job that we do. Um, our other principles are, are, are really transparency. ProMed is, tries to be fully transparent. You don't know who is going to need to know about an outbreak and when they're going to need to know about it. So we make it available to anyone, anytime, and it's free. And um, we, we, we think that's really important. Um, we, we recognize that there is a trade-off between accuracy and speed, um, and our emphasis is probably on the latter. We want to be out there first, um, but we, of course, also want to be accurate. Um, the formal public health system is, um, you know, we're fortunate in, in, in the U.S. It's a pretty robust system. We have good ways of detecting diseases. We have good laboratory surveillance, um, and uh, we have a, 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 a rich public health system that can respond and detect um, outbreaks quickly. That's not true everywhere in the world. And even in the U.S., we think that there's a value, there's a complementary value to event-based surveillance or informal kinds of disease surveillance, using media reports, using astute um, clinicians or other observers to see when things are happening and report them without needing a formal structure to report them. Also, <coughs> the ability to report on events that don't necessarily have a name. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons that HIV was missed for so many years, uh, you know, HIV was, you know, was, was seen here in the U.S. In, in 1981. It was recognized as an entity but it had probably been around for 30 or more years and had never been seen. And I think one of the reasons for that is that there wasn't a box to check. There was no diagnostic test. And so the ability to, um, to recognize threats that don't have a name or a laboratory diagnosis is also important. And I think that's part of the informal disease surveillance that, um, that, that ProMed performs. Also, the, the freedom from political constraint is, is another issue that's important. As, a, as, a, as an NGO, as a nonprofit organization, we can more or less say what we want and say it when we want to, and we're not being told by, um, by, by anybody that, that this is you know, going to be bad for the economy, it's going to be bad for trade, it's going to be bad for other, other issues, and so we're, we're more or less free to, um, to, to say what we want when we want to say it. And uh, that's really the, the, the driving motivation um, behind ProMed. We have about um, 60 people that work on ProMed all over the world. Um, about uh, a quarter of them are, are veterinary health specialists. They're people who work in, in, in uh, outside of human health or either in, in environmental health or in, in veterinary health, either basic scientists or clinicians, veterinary clinicians. And so, again, it's, it's part of how we operationalize um, One Health and have done so really since, since the beginnings of ProMed. Um, I think I've talked too long already and I'll stop there and uh, pass it back to Kathy. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction and I'll just note that ProMed includes both infectious disease reports but also toxin exposure. So, you know, broadening from just infectious disease. Um, thank you for the wonderful remarks. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Lance Brooks, who is Chief of the Biological Threat Reduction Department at the Defense uh, Department of Defense. Over to you, Dr. Brooks. All right. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to start off by uh, why One Health is important to a uh, Defense Department, to a security agency, uh, and give you a little slant from a security perspective. Um, one is uh, bio has been used weaponized, uh, as you know, during the Cold War, and as Larry said, that uh, most of the weapons used are zoonotic in nature. I think about 80% of the select agent list is uh, zoonotic in nature. Uh, so there is a great overlap just naturally with public health and animal health, and I would say that if you're working in the security sector, especially in bio, that you should have a One Health perspective and slant on, on things just by the nature of, of the organisms that have been used. Uh, also, we look at uh, emerging diseases as a security threat, so we look at everything from a national security lens, 
But a program like ours that works with international partners, with partner nations, looks at on the perspective of um, the security and stability of our partner nations as well. And we've also been charged with an uh, apartment defense since we deploy forces all over the world is how do we best safeguard those forces. And we've been charged of looking at it from not only a, a bio threat terrorism standpoint, but also from an uh, outbreak standpoint of being able to detect and report so that commanders out in the field can make decisions to protect their troops and we can protect our allies. Um, and we also know that uh, if you take this approach, it is by nature a multi-sectoral approach. Public health sector, animal sector, security sector. And now you're looking at early, early detection reporting, um, you know, like as for ProBed, we wanna see those events as early as possible. As you said, outbreaks will happen, whether terrorist, accidental, or natural. Our job, our goal, is to prevent them from becoming pandemics, or in our standpoint case, is uh, from a security standpoint, is preventing it from becoming a national security threat or a threat to our international partners. So we started out as a program dismantling bioweapons programs from the Cold War uh, from our adversaries. Uh, they used, uh, their viewpoint was using these threats not only on the human population, but also to significantly uh, impact our animal and agricultural sector as well. So they had the full gamut of, of agents uh, at their disposal. Uh, so we, we focused on those in the former Soviet Union countries, but as we expanded our program out into the rest of the world, obviously not everyone has a bioweapons program, thank goodness. Um, the focus then became on the latter part of protecting our forces and our allies um, for, for a number of those reasons I said earlier. So, uh, so we then focused on biosecurity, biosafety measures, and also the biosurveillance measure for doing that early detection reporting. And, um, and detection, as mentioned, uh, really had to focus on looking at events to be able to early on discern whether it was intentional, accidental, or uh, natural, because each of those may initially start uh, in the same fashion of detecting the event, but how you begin to react and mitigate it has then some different forks in the branch. Um, and also, um, it, it will involve different sectors uh, to act earlier than rather than later, and so there has to be good communication across the sectors. So we work, um, putting this into action by looking at uh, systems approach, as Billy mentioned earlier, at sustainable solutions for the countries. We go into a number of partner nations and we find that there's a heavy emphasis on public health and virtually no emphasis on the agricultural sector and their laboratories. I just said 80% of bio threat weapons are zoonotic in nature and a good portion of those are housed in agricultural labs around the world with no security safety measures put into place because most of the countries that we work with just don't have the investment and with donors and taking some of their limited resource would rather place it in the public health because that you know is where the focus is on on the people and gains the most headlines and some of these countries don't have a large agricultural sector large um, producers um, so we, we definitely take a look at this. We focus on infrastructure. Uh, it goes well beyond just security, guards, guns, and gates on securing pathogens. Um, it, it also focuses on getting rid of unnecessary collections, which as scientists don't ever want to let go of a sample you've ever collected in your life. We realize that. But uh, some, some pose more of a risk and a hazard uh, than they're worth. And, you can usually consolidate down to a uh, meaningful collection that will still add value because you still need to be able to characterize and, and do a no number of uh, actions uh, to, to be able to uh, characterize an outbreak. Uh, so you can't ever get rid of uh, collections completely. Um, we focus on training and equipping. So there is the component of making sure that uh, folks have the capability on both the health and animal side uh, to have the appropriate diagnostics in place, uh, how to carry those out, uh, and provide a meaningful result. Um, quickness, but also accuracy is, is what we're shooting for, uh, which requires um, constant um, uh, training and, and use and utilization in the laboratory. Um, so we, we reinforce this 
uh, through science projects, research projects. So it's, it's one thing to provide the capability, uh, but to keep your skills fresh in a laboratory, you've got to exercise these uh, constantly. The other thing we can do through research and science is bring together the public health and the animal sector, the wildlife sector, security sector, to work on projects together. Um, just by providing capability, uh, you're not really incentivizing, you're not really teaching uh, folks to work in a One Health capacity. So I would implore anybody out there that, um, that does invest in these areas, does provide grants and such uh, for research, is that you can build in a One Health component into your solicitation and, and your requirements that you put out there. This is one way we kind of help force the sectors to get together and work together. Um, honestly, even like in our federal government, uh, collaborating with the interagency is a, is a other duty is assigned unless somebody gives you money to work together on a specific project or effort with that agency. It's just been my experience over 25 years in the federal government. It works like that worldwide. So if you want to implement One Health, you certainly uh, need to take the resources and build it into to what you're doing. Uh, the other thing uh, we, we do is we run a number of exercises, tabletop exercises, uh, when these issues come up on exactly uh, how the sectors work together, uh, how they detect, how they report, and who would come to play uh, once, once uh, uh, these things are, are found out. The, the other thing, it's all about building relationships too and maintaining those relationships. And lastly, uh, a mechanism we use is what we call threat reduction networks. Our goal is to reduce the threats out there and the risk. And we do it through uh, functional research directed networks. Uh, one that I'll highlight is the BAT One Health Research Network, or BORN. Uh, came about by just training a number of partners on how to do uh, BAT collection. Uh, how to do appropriately sample, and also to bring in the conservationist to make sure that we don't have to kill every bat we sample because we want to release them. We want to be good stewards out there. <laughs> and, uh, and bringing together the community and putting some resources to that to maintain these relationships, do some coordinated research together, but hopefully then this will build a sustainable network of folks that will continue to work together from all the multiple sectors and we can do it with just minimal uh, amount of resources, research dollars to keep folks integrated and working together on a national stage in One Health. So I'll end there for now. Thanks. Thank you so much for that really excellent example of science diplomacy and capacity strengthening and where a One Health approach can really help in that regard. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brooks. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Barton Barovish, who is captain of the US Public Health Service and director of the One Health office at the CDC. Over to you. Hi, thanks to the organizers. I'm pleased to be here to speak with you all today. So I'm representing the CDC, the lead public health agency in the United States. One Health is important to us because many of the issues we work on require thinking about those interconnections between people, animals, plants, and our shared environment. And a big focus of our One Health work is on infectious diseases and zoonotic diseases covering everything from anthrax to Zika. But we also do One Health work on environmental health issues, food safety, um, mental health aspects, the opioid crisis, and a number of other areas um, beyond infectious diseases. So CDC established a One Health office in 2009, and we were the first federal agency to do that. There are other agencies that have One Health coordination units are a dedicated One Health coordinator, and many others are starting to recognize the importance of that and making plans to do that, which is, is something that's very important. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about what we're doing to coordinate One Health in the United States, as well as some of our global One Health work as to putting One Health into to practice. So in the United States, we have been working very hard across multiple different agencies and departments to advance One Health in our country. 
And something that really spurred interest in doing this beyond the other duties as assigned mm -hmm. was whenever we did a joint external evaluation in the United States as part of the global health security activities. And it forced a lot of partners to come together from all across the federal government to talk about shared areas related to things like surveillance, um, ports and border control, antimicrobial resistance, laboratory, workforce, zoonotic diseases, and many other technical areas covered um, in that. And we really recognize there's some major gaps in One Health coordination in the United States. So we have done several things to address that. First is we um, got together multiple federal partners from Health and Human Services, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Department of Interior, EPA, NOAA, and others to come together and prioritize our top zoonotic diseases of greatest national concern for the United States that we want to use a One Health approach to address. So we held a workshop about a year ago, and in addition to prioritizing eight zoonotic diseases, um, we also develop some next steps and action plans around where the major gaps are in One Health for our country. And we're actively working together, um, being coordinated between CDC, USDA, DOI, and other partners to um, develop a national One Health framework for our country, targeting some of those key areas and making plans for the next five years as to what we're gonna do and how we're gonna coordinate across the federal government. Also, we've set up a One Health federal interagency network, which is a group of federal partners who come together every other month and share updates and information on One Health activities and find areas where we might be able to collaborate or coordinate. If any of you are representing an agency that's not involved in that, please contact me. We're happy to, to get you added to our One Health Federal Interagency Network. We also do a lot to try to put out information and timely updates on zoonotic diseases as well as One Health topics through our zoonoses and One Health updates call that we hold once a month um, and welcome you all to participate in that and present on that call to, to share timely updates. Also in the U.S., we have some unique public-private partnerships for areas where there are gaps around preventing zoonoses. Um, one example of that is our work with the, the pet industry to collaborate to prevent zoonotic diseases um, in the absence of regulation on some of these animal species. We also work very effectively with other agencies through having liaisons in place. So we have a USDA liaison from the Veterinary Services and also two from the Food Safety and Inspection Service housed at CDC in Atlanta. Um, we do this with FDA as well. Um, and we actually even have some global liaisons working at the Food and Agricultural Organization in Rome and the World Organization for Animal Health in Paris to help continue with those important collaborations. On the global side, um, we, we frequently work on global health issues, global health security agenda being a big part of that and global health security in general and work very closely with the World Health Organization, FAO and OIE on um, filling some of these One Health gaps that we're seeing globally. There's been a lot of excitement and enthusiasm from countries in um, building One Health structures, incorporating One Health into um, their capacity building activities, which is really important. And there's been a recognition that there's a number of tools and toolkits needed to be able to, to better advance One Health in those countries. So we're actively working with partners to build some of those and pilot those and make it easier for multiple countries to be able to use them um, regardless of the region or the, the language that's being used there. Um, and then I wanna just wrap up some of those highlights from CDC's One Health work into saying there's no single person, organization, or sector that can address One Health alone. It's definitely 
a team effort. We have to coordinate, communicate, and collaborate with each other. We need to think about how to embed that in workforce training to help make this something we don't have to talk about in the future. <laughs> it just becomes the normal way of, of doing business. And, and to do that, we need to start small and build from there. And then I want to say that with Frank's point about not being too prescriptive on what we mean about One Health or putting a, a straitjacket on it so we can be flexible, that's important. But it's also very important to have a kind of common denominator that we use when we're talking about One Health so people and partners and importantly policymakers will understand um, why this is important and, and what it all means. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryan Baravesh, and really nice summary of One Health from A to Z with uh, Anthrax and Zika, and then really exciting to see the progress here in the U.S. with the national One Health framework that's coming on board and also the One Health structures that are being formed abroad. Thank you so much. Um, last but not least, yeah. our final panelist is Dr. Uh, Patty Bright, Patricia Bright, um, who is Senior Advisor for uh, the U.S. Geological Survey and an expert in environmental health and is now detailed to the USAID Emerging Pandemic Threats Program. Over to you, Dr. Bright. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. I am just delighted that the Wilson Center and its partners are taking on this issue. It's one which definitely needs to be further advanced, and so thank you for doing that. Um, as Catherine mentioned, I work for the U.S. Geological Survey, um, which when I say I'm a veterinary epidemiologist, that often puzzles people. Why would, the, why would I work with the Geological Survey? <laughs> Most people think of USGS and they think of volcanoes or earthquakes. Um, we're actually a natural science agency and we actually do a, a really broad range of work. Um, we do everything from environmental health to ecosystems to water, uh, climate and land use, natural disasters, um, energy and mineral resources. And Dr. Sleeman, who's here, um, we have some amazing capabilities. I know Dr. Sleeman is here. He's going to be speaking in a little bit. Um, he heads up our National Wildlife Health Center. So um, I think if you're ever out in Madison, Wisconsin, call him up. Ask him for a tour because it's a really amazing <laughs> place. Um, so the USGS, we actually sit within the Department of Interior. Um, as I said, we're a natural resource science agency, but the Department of Interior also includes things like Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, Bureau of Land Management, um, so these are agencies that actually have a responsibility for managing natural resources as well as land. And so their responsibility is not only for keeping natural resources healthy, but also keeping people healthy, right? Because we have a lot of visitors to DOI lands, be it to national parks or to refuges. Um, when I noticed, when I first started at USGS back in 2007, I actually came on as a wildlife disease coordinator. Um, and as part of that job, my boss asked me to attend a number of interagency meetings. And these were all, you know, some of them were on disease, some of them were on security. They were all kind of inherently One Health topics. But what was really interesting to me was that it was almost all public health and agriculture folks who were at the table. And so, you know, one of my colleagues, we used to joke, we used to call it two-thirds health because it always seemed <laughs> like the environmental component got <coughs> forgotten. Um, and we always felt like we had to justify over and over again why the natural resource agencies should be sitting at the table. You know, and I'm happy to say a decade later, I feel like that's really changed. I think there's a, a true acknowledgement for bringing all of the components to the table. So, um, so I, I think we've got, you know, we still have some work to do, but I think we've definitely moved forward. So today, um, I just wanted to, in my remarks, I wanted to touch on kind of two things. One, I wanted to touch on what I think are some of the gaps that need to be addressed, kind of how do we bridge some of those silos if we're really going to move forward and advance um, One Health. And the second thing is I just wanted to touch very briefly on a new project that we are embarking upon at USAID um, with the hope that we might kind of spark some new partnerships with folks here in the room. Uh, so to begin with, in terms of kind of looking across those silos, there are three things that I think we really need to address. Uh, the one really Frank said very well, which is I think we need to think more holistically about what type of diseases we include when we're talking about One Health. Um, I think we naturally tend to default to infectious diseases or vector-borne diseases. But we know that there are multiple factors out there. So there are things like non-communicable diseases, right, diabetes, obesity, um, as well as toxicological diseases. And we know that typically organisms are not just um, exposed to one of those things in isolation, right? We're exposed to those things all the time. They're all cofactors. So we really need to be thinking about how do you bring those things to the table. Um, you know, and, and it's interesting because I think we still have a lot of silos, whether we look at federal agencies, whether we look at academia, whether we even look at professional organizations, right? We tend to have our infectious disease folks, we tend to have our toxicological folks, we tend to have our diabetes folks, and, and we don't often talk. And so I think it's really important that we kind of reach across the, the table there. 
Um, I was at the Society for Environmental Toxicology meeting about two years ago, and they decided to do kind of a One Health. They were thinking about trying to put together a One Health working group. And so they invited people to come together at lunch, and there was probably about 60 people in the room. And they asked how many people had actually heard the term One Health or knew what it meant. And I would say there was a handful of people that raised their hands. And I was really surprised. I mean, I think they understand the idea of working together, but it was like they had not heard that terminology. And for me, it's such a common term that I was really surprised. But it's clear then that we are not, you know, we may be communicating, but we're not communicating with the same language across our, across our silos. Um, I think a really good example of this, um, of, of why we need to look at these things, for example, at USGS, we do a lot of work looking at um, endocrine disrupting compounds. So for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, these are compounds that are estrogen-like compounds. They can come from pesticides. They can come from pharmaceuticals in wastewater. Um, and what we're seeing here in the Potomac is we see a lot of intersex fish. So these are primarily male fish with um, eggs on their testes. And when we think about endocrine-disrupting compounds, we usually think of, you know, kind of they cause reproductive um, abnormalities. But they also cause immune suppression. And so we're seeing um, a number of die-offs here in the Potomac in fish from pathogens that normally would not be a problem. And so there is some concern that perhaps this, you know, this continued exposure to EDCs in the Potomac is actually leading to more and more of these outbreaks and die-offs. So again, I think trying to think more holistically is really important. Um, point number two, um, One Health is really critical when it comes to the idea of food safety and security. And I think we need to remember that there are subsistence hunters and fishers that need to be included in that discussion. And I think EcoHealth Alliance and their partners have done a really good job of kind of raising that um, issue on the global level, you know, thinking about, for example, how bushmeat, um, what role it plays in zoonotic disease transmission. <coughs> but I think um, for those of us who are working in the U.S. too, we tend to forget it's also a domestic issue. Um, I think if I say, if I said to someone um, subsistence hunting and fishing, most people would say, oh, you mean like rural Alaska. Well, yes, rural Alaska is important. But it actually happens across the U.S., both in rural and urban areas. As a matter of fact, right here in D.C., we have a large contingent of the population that relies on the Potomac River for their primary source of protein. So I think kind of keeping that in mind that that's an issue that needs to be brought to the forefront. Um, third, I think uh, kind of going back to that idea of thinking more broadly than just <coughs> infectious diseases is also who comes to the table. You know, I mentioned earlier the Society for Environmental Toxicology. We haven't, you know, on the infectious disease side, we don't really engage with them. Um, the American Geological Union, you know, there's another group that we probably ought to be engaging with. Um, I think, you know, the we, we think about things like soil when it comes to vector-borne diseases, but I think soil is really kind of an underappreciated factor <laughs> when it comes to disease. Um, you know, you think about soil geochemistry, soil moisture, soil temperature. All of those things affect uh, not only vectors and pathogens, but also contaminants, right? So um, they play a role in the distribution and the spread, but they also play a role in persistence, they play a role in degradation, and what might those uh, pathogens or chemicals degrade into. So again, I think of trying to think more broadly about bringing to the table not just the usual suspects, you know, the veterinarians, the physicians, the, the disease ecologists, but also starting to think about bringing the geologists, the hydrologists, and others to the table. Um, one other point that I didn't have on my paper but um, made me think as, as Casey and others were talking is that we don't have a good way of really appreciating what other agencies and other organizations are doing. You know, um, Lance, we met with Lance groups a few weeks ago and we were talking about this and, you know, Casey mentioned the, the Federal One Health Network and I think um, there's a real need for us to be trying to figure out how do we start to kind of catalog some of the work that's being done so we're not duplicating efforts and we can actually start to leverage work that's being done by others. And then the last thing I wanted to touch on is I mentioned I'm on, on detail over to um, U.S. Agency for International Development in their Global Health Division. Um, and I'm, so I'm working in their emerging uh, disease threats, and we're starting a new project over there to look at how do you prevent and mitigate zoonotic disease and antimicrobial resistance. And we're working, looking specifically at working in countries that are um, high-risk, high-priority countries under the uh, Global Health Security Agenda. Um, but what's kind of new and innovative about this is that um, we're actually looking to work with the private sector. And traditionally, we have worked with the public sector for, you know, WHO, um, FAO, OIE. So the idea here is really to try to figure out how do we develop more of those public-private partnerships, um, because I think we all acknowledge, and, and others have said this as well, that, you know, the private sector has a key role to play here. There are things that they can do as, um, you know, as change agents that I think the public sector cannot do alone. And so the idea here is how do we try to start reaching out to them it's kind of an interesting process that we're going to use. It's a new process called co-creation. 
Um, so I'm still learning about it, but it's really the idea that we're going to try to bring both the public and the private sector together and try to come up with these solutions together. So rather than kind of putting something very prescriptive out there, look for ways to kind of bring folks together. Um, I'm really hoping, and I'm going to touch with, with folks here afterwards at the Wilson Center, that maybe um, the Wilson Center might be a way to also try to keep some of the partners here who, like I said, are not the usual suspects, so folks that we're looking for, to kind of come to the table as we kind of move through this process and help us make sure that we're, we're moving in the right direction. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bright. And I think you, you raised um, such an important issue of broadening the tent and including the private sector. And of course, we have a representative from um, you know non-governmental non agencies here. So thank you so much. And also a really brilliant example of a local issue where a One Health approach can help. Um, I'm sensitive to the time a bit, um, but moderator's prerogative if we can extend just a bit. Um, uh, I have some questions for the panel, but I'd also like to open it up to the audience, too. And maybe we could take a few questions and then um, respond as the panel sees fit. Yes, please. Are there any others? I think we have two. Two. Maybe we'll we'll just take okay, a few and then respond. All right. Hold thank you. Oh. Thank thank you for that the the, uh, the topics that you raised. Um, in terms of incorporating the environment as one of the key components and looking at the earth as an organism in in and of itself, we already um, have too many microbes in the human form who are uh, spewing out tox toxins in various different places, plastics in some places, other mm -hmm. environmental contaminants. So the entire earth and the environment should be a subject uh, of focus in and of itself. But yet, all our world economies are all geared towards growth at, at all cost. And having regulations is usually uh, not the norm, or there's an anti-push uh, towards regulations. So how would the individual from the World Bank and the representatives from government choose to address this when we have an overall push for growth at all costs in the setting of uh, at our own peril? Thank you. I think we had one more. Just because I know people are listening online, uh, thank you for joining us today. A uh, quick question. I am a AAAS fellow placed at the National Science Foundation, which focuses obviously on the basic research and technology aspects. And I am curious about is whether there is any discussion about what technological advances are lacking or needed in your respective work and how that um, certain breakthroughs or advances are needed to be enable the next step forward in your endeavors in the larger organizational structure or, uh, or in, the, in the field work. Thank you. Shall I repeat the questions or re respond? Um, I'll just summarize just in case anyone online didn't um, hear. So questions on um, climate change and the impacts and, and um, opportunities for action. Also uh, the risk of, you know, we heard interstellar, interplanetary um, pathogens and um, this 
kind of growth at all cost and you know where the the role of regulation comes in or where it may not align and then also the opportunities for technological advances in your field so uh, any responses that you could you could thank you uh, the, the, the the climate change question is a, is an interesting and and very difficult one I think <coughs> excuse me um, I, I think Undoubtedly, climate change will have an impact on infectious diseases um, mediated in, in ways that um, we can't even um, begin to predict. Um, there are <laughs> changes in vectors, changes in, in growth of microorganisms. We know, you know every the reproductive rate of pathogens is certainly affected by, by temperature and in both in the environment and in hosts and in, in intermediate hosts. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a huge and unanswered question. There was an interesting um, paper looking at um, antimicrobial resistance, which is another topic that's been, that's been raised here. And uh, it, it appears that temperature or climate has an impact even on rates of antimicrobial resistance, which appear to increase with, with temperature. Um, so, so I think that the, the questions are, it's, it's a fascinating, difficult, interesting question that I think we are just beginning to, uh, to, to, to learn about. Certainly, um, the environment uh, is plays, it plays a huge role, and I think, you know, the other impacts of, of growth of populations, incursions of populations into, into new areas, et cetera, also obviously have a, have a huge impact. And I, I, I can't answer the question except to say that I think it will have big impacts and we, uh, we are ill-prepared. So, yeah. sure, I'll take a stab at one or two. Um, so the, the growth at all costs, I think uh, the One Health platform is actually an excellent opportunity to discuss some of those issues. I know that there's a number of organizations and governments starting to look at, I think one of the biggest challenges is um, or, or more bigger concern is just stripping forests to replace with agriculture. And I know like EcoHealth Alliance is working with some countries of looking at modeling, looking at public health, looking at animal health, and the, the impact of, of that on the environment and maybe the shift of disease burden on top of that. So I think as you get into that, that's where you have that discussion, and it has to be multi-sectoral, and it also has to involve the private sector, because the biggest complaint is, well, it is over-regulation, but a lot of times it's regulation without due representation in the process, right, and the, villain, the willingness to have that voice at the table. So I, I think this forum and One Health platform actually lends itself to having those discussions and maybe getting multidisciplinary folks together. It's no easy solution. But the more voices you get around the table, it's complicated, it's more messy, but you, you get to address the problem in whole instead of just one-sided from one view, and that would be the recommendation uh, going forward. Uh, one Health, innovation, um, you know, uh, it's, we have separate diagnostic platforms for everything, stovepipe from public health to animal health. Uh, one of the things as we're dealing with something like African swine fever now outbreak in Southeast Asia is actually, as we would say in the public health world, point of care, point of use, diagnostics and such is probably what's really needed, especially in more developing countries and such, uh, but getting, getting the, the detection, the test and the result out in the field instead of having uh, to, to bring it back to laboratory and such right away, especially when you have a huge impact on agriculture and the only solution is to call an entire herd. So you wanna know that answer pretty quick. So the, this just one off the top of my head that's always keeps reoccurring um, in, the, in the diagnostic world of being able to get out in the field with some precision and reliability. So I wanna address a specific question. Um, the first person asked about is NASA involved and they are a participant in our One Health Federal Interagency Network. We've had them um, visit at CDC and have talked with them about a, a number of One Health issues. So yes, the answer is yes to that. Um, regarding um, technology and in advances, definitely the, the diagnostic testing aspect is, um, is important and a lot of room for, for innovation there connecting across human, animal, and environmental health. 
Also, the same goes for surveillance. Surveillance can be challenging in itself, and especially when you're trying to link and share information across systems. Um, at CDC, we have some nice examples of One Health surveillance system, so it is possible, but there's definitely a lot of room for improvement um, in the surveillance arena. So a couple of thoughts. One, um, in terms of NASA, actually many, many years ago, I, I read a fascinating um, paper on the risk assessment that NASA did when they first went to the moon to make sure that we didn't bring anything back, which I thought was, was fascinating. Um, in terms of climate change, too, I would add, again, thinking about these other stressors, how climate change is going to impact non-communicable diseases, whether it's nutrition, whether it's heat stress, um, whatever it is, um, certainly can have an impact on infectious diseases by exacerbating uh, infectious diseases. So I think, again, thinking more broadly about how climate is going to impact health. And then back to the question of um, you know, this, uh, this idea of pushing for growth at all costs. Um, I think that's a really interesting question, and um, you know, I mentioned this project that we're um, in the project of st in the process of starting at USAID. And what we're trying to look at is how do you get ahead of the curve on some of these issues? Um, you know, I think if you look at um, where population growth is expected across the world, you know, in, in many places in Europe and the U.S., it's stable or maybe even declining. Um, but there are certain areas in Asia and Africa, for example, where we're expecting you know dramatic uh, population growth, and with population growth, we're expecting more you know economic um, growth. <coughs> Excuse me. So we do expect that there's going to be a greater demand for protein. So looking at things like zoonotic diseases, looking at things like antimicrobial resistance, um, you know, and I think Lance is right. I mean, it really, it, it can't be just, you know, the regulatory folks going in and saying, don't do this, do that. It's really bringing everybody to the table, uh, the public sector, the private sector, the farmers, um, and looking at how do we start to establish best management practices now based on, um, you know, what we know from the past. But again, it's also really making sure that we engage those local stakeholders because, you know, I think in the past sometimes we've come in, you know, on the conservation side or the environment side where it's like, well, you're kind of being paternalistic, right? You're coming in telling us what we can and can't do um, while you guys are living the good life in the U.S. So I think that, you know, part of our challenge is really to figure out who those right stakeholders are, how do we get them engaged, you know, and, and how do we keep the questions open enough so it's not here's, you know, here's the prescribed answer, but what are those kind of new technologies, those uh, new processes, those new methodologies that can be thought of to address some of these issues that we know are going to have in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for those uh, excellent responses, which I think have brought a lot of uh, new questions and opportunities to the forefront. Um, I had a question about, uh, you know, you all spoke about the data integration, and this is something that Dr. Barrett raised as well. Um, and in terms of the evidence that is needed, you know, you discussed the incentives of working together and kind of the co-creation of different projects and building in One Health to the onset. What type of ev evidence kind of going forward and where we need to go in One Health in our relative disciplines and, and the interagency uh, network, you know, what, what is needed to help drive the next step of, of One Health? And this is One Health in the 21st century, but as we look to the next Century, what do we need to kind of get help One Health into the routine workings? I'm going to look to the World Bank. <laughs> 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 no, but seriously, I mean, I think part of this is, you know, we, um, you know, for example, the U.S. Agency for International Development, um, you know, does invest money in capabilities and, and uh, you know, resources in developing countries. But I think there's also a need for, again, for others to come to the table. I think a lot of federal agencies do that. You know, they're, they're about capacity building in these countries. Um, but we also need to be um, bringing other donors to the table. So, you know, whether it's the World Bank or whether it's IMF or, um, and I'm, I'm not a, uh, you know, clearly not a financial person, so I may be misspeaking here. But, um, but I think it's important that we look at what are the type of, what type of work needs to be done um, and how can we support each other in that work? How can we, you know, if, if the World Bank is interested in funding something, can we provide them with some kind of technical expertise to say, here's what we're doing or not doing, here's what's worked, and vice versa, because I think there's a lot of good experience. But again, um, at least from my, from where I sit, the financial side of it has often been uh, kind of separated from the technical side of it. And then whether in the United States or in other countries, I think something important for advancing or strengthening One Health is having some sort of formal coordination structures that 
can be for government, it can be for government and other partners, but there, there needs to be some sort of formal structure in place. Mm -hmm. So if people get promoted or retire or win the lottery, et cetera, the work still continues and there's kind of agreement to, to how things are gonna go and be coordinated. We've got some great examples of that, like out of Kenya with their zoonotic disease unit um, with national One Health platforms done in a number of global health security agenda countries and, and others. And that's something we're working towards in the United States as well. Yeah, I, it goes back to what I, what I said earlier is um, some, uh, some agencies and organizations can start now by looking at solicitations and uh, requirements you're putting out there if you're uh, funding uh, agency or developmental agency is, is starting to build that in um, to, to that um, solicitations to get folks to address One Health and ensure that it's incorporated in the capacity building that's going on. Um, just like the ZDU, I was going to mention Canada, uh, Kenya, because we help support fund that with CDC's help and with State Department's help and, and others. Um, they actually have a veterinarian and a, a public health officer sitting in a dedicated unit uh, that get their respective feeds in, and they go over the outbreak reports from all over the countries. Um, and they have a formal MOU between Ministry of Health and Ministry of Agriculture that they will review all outbreaks together and determine a coordinated response if one is needed. So that's an example of how we can help facilitate and, and drive those type of things. But I think we can already start doing it by starting to incorporate this. You don't have to wait from a, a you know a directed edict from Congress or or from the office of the uh, executive office of the president uh, to do this. Uh, if it makes sense to do, like I said, in the security sector, it just makes sense to do uh, that we can start some of these initiatives from the grassroots level and start building them in. Eventually, uh, bigger policy catches up. I would just add that, you know, meetings like this where we actually talk to one another across sectors are, are really important and, you know, the, the saying that a crisis is a bad time to be exchanging yeah. business cards <laughs> is, is, yeah. is, is true. And um, having meetings like this, that Wilson, thank, thank you to the Wilson Center and to EcoHealth for, for sponsoring this, but um, meetings like the CDC-sponsored meeting, uh, the International uh, Conference on Emerging Infectious Diseases, the meeting that, uh, that, that ProMed helped sponsor, the International Meeting on Emerging Diseases, and, and other places where there can be cross-sectoral um, conversation um, is it, it, th those those are really important thank you so much to our wonderful panelists and I think you you really set up today's agenda because we have some discussion at the breakout session so we'll get to really hear from one another and discuss um, I'd like to thank uh, dr. Barrett and all of our panelists for the really excellent start to the day um, and I think now we have a short coffee break so please be back in 10 minutes um, and thank you all so much <coughs> Thank you. That's really good. That's really good. Thanks.